just pronounced that wrong. Lauren, did I pronounce it wrong? It's a okay. little bit wrong. <laughs> Lauren, Lauren is a chaired professor in media ethics at the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern. He's a former dean there. He has served as an editor and publisher um, of the Southbridge Massachusetts Evening News and president and owner of the parent company, uh, president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, um, editor and author um, told of six journalism books. Um, so you can already see that I'm beginning to feel intimidated by all of our panelists. Uh, Eric Lieberman, um, who is a Duke Law graduate, I'm proud to say, is Vice President and Counsel at the Washington Post. Um, and he has long experience there and also um, has been um, a practicing lawyer at a Washington law firm, Williams and Connolly, where he represented clients in both civil and criminal matters. So you can already see we have journalists, we have people um, who have an academic perspective on journalism, we have practicing lawyers, we have people representing the press. Um, uh, next on our panel is Malcolm Moran, who holds the night chair in sports journalism and society at Penn State University. That allows him to draw on uh, over 30 years of experience as a, a award-winning and respected sports journalist. He's worked at the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, and USA Today, uh, where in addition to covering uh, sports, he wrote feature articles on uh, professional and college sports. And in addition to teaching and working with uh, journalism professor, uh, professionals, he's the director of their Center for Sports Journalism in the College of Communication. Uh, Bill Raspberry is the Knight Professor of Practice of Journalism and Public Policy Studies at Duke's own Terry Sanford Institute. And as probably many of you know, he was a columnist at the Washington Post for almost four decades, uh, retiring from the paper only at the end of uh, 2005 and is well known for his commentaries often on public policy concerns, including uh, crime and justice and drug abuse and lots of other uh, topics. Um, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner for that commentary. Uh, the final panelist is Ari Shapiro, legal correspondent for NPR News, where he covers major federal prosecutions, national legal trends, and the internal operations of the Justice Department. He was previously uh, a reporter for NPR in Miami, Atlanta, and Boston, and had an opportunity to cover controversies such as the fate of Terry Chavo, um, the abuse of Iraqi <coughs> detainees at Abu Ghraib, and legal proceedings against soldiers accused of those abuses. So we have a tremendous panel to think about the coverage of these uh, mega cases. Um, and as earlier speakers have said, the Duke lacrosse case, as it's often called, is only one of uh, many others. You could all tick off uh, many of them. The rape charges against Kobe Bryant, uh, the recent charges against Michael Vick, the Jenna Six, John Benet Ramsey, uh, Richard Jewell, the O.J. Simpson case number one, O.J. Simpson number two, O.J. Simpson number three, um, <coughs> Scott Peterson, Lacey and Connor, I'll bet those are names that you all know. How do these cases come to the fore? How are they treated by the journalists? What is the set of responsibilities here in the traditional media? The next panel will be the new media, but the traditional media and um, we're going to organize ourselves by having each speaker speak for uh, no more than four or five minutes to put some ideas on the table and then have some discussion uh, back and forth. So I'm going to ask Sylvia Adcock to kick things off, not only because she's an A, uh, but um, because we want to start thinking of this from the perspective of the individual reporter and how this process looks from the perspective of the individual reporter how do, how, how, how do you get these cases? What are you supposed to be doing? What are the pressures you're operating under? So Sylvia, will you get us started? OK. Um, so we've all heard the term media circus. And I'll try to start off by giving you a little bit of a peek under the tent. Um, we all know the major elements that make a story big. Uh, a drunk driving arrest that means nothing somewhere else will become big news if it involves a pop star in Hollywood. Um, there are far more people that are killed in automobile accidents in this country every year, but it's the plane crash that kills 200 people that becomes huge news, which uh, you can he you'll hear a lot about from the airlines if you cover that industry. Um, and then there are the unexpected stories, the stories editors are always looking for of the surprising, something that's different, 
a reader, a reader friendly story, um, what one of my old editors used to call a Hey Mabel story. Hey Mabel referring to the fact that you'd like the husband to nudge his wife at the breakfast table and say, Hey Mabel, did you see that story in the paper today? But things are changing pretty fast, and nobody is named Mabel anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> Reporters in the middle of a major breaking story, whether it is what might be considered traditionally newsworthy by journalistic standards or whether it's just Lindsay Lowen's latest brush with the law, can find themselves in a push-pull situation. The pressure to not miss something, to make sure that you have everything your competition has, is enormous. Some of that competition comes from the internet, from the new media that's come, from uh, and it's driven, of course, by editors to reporters, but reporters have their own competitive streak, um, which is what makes good reporters great, but also can take its toll. Um, I've been in, in, in the middle of a dozen reporters staking out the home of a serial killer in New York for days, waiting for his mother or his sister to come out and say something, anything, one thing to the press. Um, I should note the serial killer was actually uh, convicted, so I don't have to use the word suspected before his name at this point. Um, I've covered court cases in which the rush from press conference to press conference to press conference after the proceedings seems like an exercise in futility, given the fact that we were all being, getting the same manufactured news. I once spent half a day in the middle of a major breaking news story chasing a blind item that appeared on the website of a major national newspaper. By blind, I mean that the reporter in, in that item had used anonymous sources and was not attributing it to anyone who had a name. It was on my beat. I knew that the item was probably uh, going to turn out to be wrong, but I had to basically prove to my editors that it was wrong. When I say I lost half a day reporting on that, that may not seem like much to some of you, but if you've ever been involved in a breaking news story, half a day is a lifetime and you lose a lot of ground. It turned out that I was right and the major newspaper was wrong. Um, but it took a lot of my time to simply um, kind of try to uh, have to prove that something else was not correct. Um, I had an error edit edited into a story once because someone on the desk had seen something on CNN and changed the wording of my story slightly. Um, to make it sound as though a group of professionals that I covered had done something wrong. I was furious, my sources were furious, and I was lucky in that my editors agreed with me, made the right decision, that we needed to write an entire story the next day correcting the situation instead of the usual page two correction, which frankly I don't believe anyone ever reads. But I believe one of the biggest problems in journalism today is not the way the sensational stories are handled, not whether we're spending too much time covering Lindsay Lowen, um, and not the competition that is coming from everywhere, but the fact that the economic pressure that's being put on the media, particularly I'm talking about the print media because that's where I come from, uh, by large corporate owners who are beholden to stockholders who want to see nothing more than a jump in the stock price are going to slowly, I believe, eat away at the talent and experience that it takes to put out a great paper. Newsroom staffs across the country are shrinking, and that's a problem. Fewer and fewer newspapers are going to be able to afford to have specialty beats where reporters are, can become experts in their subjects can develop sources and break news and set an agenda rather than simply react to whatever's being put out there. Fewer and fewer newspapers are going to be able to send people to Washington or overseas, and that's a problem for all of us. So while I worry about the time and energy that may be spent covering these cases that may or may not be really news, I worry more about us getting into a situation where only a very small number of newspapers are able to provide the kind of reporting firepower that print media has traditionally provided in this country to hold our public officials and our government and everyone else accountable. Uh, Malcolm, I know that you were concerned about changes, marketplace kind of changes too. Do you want to touch on that now? One of the things that came to mind when we were preparing for this is that, and I bring a slightly different perspective to it because uh, 
I would have been waist deep in all of this, except for the fact that I was away interviewing for the job that became the job that I have now. I have a lot of friends that covered that. I spent 19 years at the New York Times. I know how careful people are there about the way they go about their business. I know how painful this episode was to friends of mine that work there. The thing that concerns me is that as much as we've heard about all these different cases, and a lot of them appear uh, in a course packet for a news media ethics course I teach at Penn State, there's a chance it could only get worse because of the technology. I mean, what we learned from studying the McCarthy era and how he manipulated the press was that he would determine the deadlines of AM and PM reporters and he would feed them unverifiable things that were reported as fact because he knew that they wouldn't have time to check it out before their deadline. Well, if there was a McCarthy in 2007, he wouldn't have to do that because the technology's already done it for him. We live in a 24-7 real-time environment, and 24 hours ago, when the topic of time and competition came up in my classroom, <coughs> what I said was, don't look down because that safety net isn't there anymore. Up until seven or eight years ago, most editors in this country seemed to operate on the premise that if some piece of information came available at noon, we are not going to post it at 12.30. We are not going to let everybody else have this information and play catch up for the next eight to 10 hours so that it looks like it's a tie. It's not a tie. We believe we have this alone, and we're going to break this in tomorrow morning's paper the way that we've been doing it for hundreds of years. Well, because of the economic forces and the necessity to promote websites, now a lot of that information may be posted at 12.30. And the problem is the safety net is gone. And, and that's, that's the biggest concern that I have, because there's going to be another DA. There's going to be another authority figure who is going to stand up at a press conference and say something that's going to be accepted as fact. And what we have lost is the ability to digest, the ability to report more, the ability to take the kind of care that's always been taken because of the fear that the bus is leaving town and we're left behind. I mean, one of the things that I include heavily in the news media ethics course at Penn State is constantly hammering away at the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics and using that to determine how you go about your business. Seek truth and report it. Minimize harm. Act independently. Be accountable. Those things are hard enough to hold on to when editors and reporters are talking about a story when you have five or six hours to make a decision. When you have five or six minutes, the strain becomes even more intense. In terms of grading, because that was one of the questions we came up, I mean, I would just say simply not to paint with a broad brush, but now that we live in an environment where you have one set of reporters operating by the traditional rules with those quaint 20th century traditions of cor correction boxes and editor's notes, and, and another group that will throw it against the wall to see if it sticks, m my grade would be, I'd like you to come by the office because there's a lot of makeup work that has to be done. <laughs> <laughs> but Eric, you see this as the reporter, uh, reporters bringing these legal issues to you and the, and the paper trying to take responsibility. So from the perspective of a newsroom lawyer, uh, how do you see things? Well, I usually get involved in uh, high-profile criminal cases and investigations, really, in two ways. Um, one, uh, first and most commonly, I'll get a frantic phone call from a reporter at the courthouse um, saying, they just closed me out of the courtroom, this is outrageous, we have to sue right away. Um, or they won't give me the names of the jurors, or in the, in the Massawi trial recently, the judge won't let us see the exhibits, the court is too busy and they're overwhelmed, and it's just going to take a week until you can look at the exhibits. Um, and then the media lawyers uh, rally, and uh, for the traditional media, we have them on staff, like myself, and we can actually fight back and assert the First Amendment rights of access uh, 
to records and proceedings that are critical to holding the justice system accountable, especially the criminal justice system when people's liberty is at stake. Um, so we get involved filing uh, access motions to make sure our reporters can actually see what's going on and read the documents. And then the other way that I get involved is uh, in reading the stories before they go in the paper when uh, there are particularly controversial subjects. Um, you know, fortunately, the Washington Post doesn't take a very narrow view of what the, the newsroom lawyer's role is in reading a story. I don't just sit there like the lawyer. And for those of you who've seen that movie, Actual Malice, it's yeah, a great absolutely. scene yeah. with the newsroom lawyer who's uh, going, going over a story with Sally Field. And um, he basically says to her, you know, the truth doesn't matter as long as we don't have actual malice. Well, fortunately, there's been a long tradition at the Post of the newsroom lawyers being not just concerned about what, whether we can defend a libel case, but whether we can defend our reputation. And so my job is uh, to layer on top of what the editors are supposed to be doing, um, which is to look at every story, question its accuracy and its fairness, so that we can defend our reputation. I mean, one, one thing that, uh, you know, Hodden Carter covered so many fabulous points, it's hard to follow him, but one thing that I, uh, I think he, he didn't touch on as much as I would have liked is the, um, I, I guess, fear, for lack of a better word, of criticism from the media. We, uh, one of our faults is that uh, we love to attack other people, but we're very thin-skinned when we come under criticism for our own failings. And in this day and age, with the blogosphere, with ombudsmans, you know, we have an ombudsman on staff at the Post, there's not one mess up that we make that doesn't run the risk of getting a lot of publicity, at least within the profession and maybe beyond that. So there's a lot of concern within the profession and in the traditional media, um, despite the fact that we make a lot of mis you know, we make mistakes. Um, they're human beings, the reporters are not lawyers, uh, they're covering stories quickly, there's a lot of information coming at them fast. They have to write it in a way that's engaging and understandable for readers. Yes, I hear from lawyers and judges all the time, can't you get these stories right? Technical mistakes and all these stories. Um, train your people better, but the commitment is there from the editors and at least from, from my perspective, from the newsroom lawyer up to the publisher to make sure that we're fair and accurate. And, um, when we're wrong, to be humble and not arrogant and to apologize. And um, uh, I agree that that's sometimes hard to get a news organization to accept, to acknowledge a mistake, um, to do it um, you know, appropriately, given the magnitude of the error. It depends on the particular situation. But all of, our, all of it comes down to the fact that you know, we are businesses and our most valuable asset is our credibility. And if we lose our credibility, you know, we have nothing at the end of the day. Um, so the Washington Post, you know, from a newsroom lawyer's perspective, is very concerned about all of these issues. We recognize that we're not perfect, um, but I, I, you know, in grading the media, I think the most, I think the the real question to ask is whether our democracy would be better off without the New York Times, NPR, the Washington Post or not, and I think the answer is we're absolutely better off with these institutions and they need to be supported. We have the resources to dig deep, to do the daily stories on, on newsworthy events and investigative pieces like what the Chicago Tribune did a couple of years ago on um, the mistakes that the justice system was making in the administration of the death penalty, which led to the suspension of the death penalty in Illinois. Um, so the traditional media plays a critical role. They care very much, they're not perfect, but boy, I, especially these, this day and age in the post 9-11 world, I wouldn't want to be without uh, institutions like the traditional media, so. Lauren, I know that, um, that you've been thinking about this in a historical perspective, um, and that's an issue that Hodding Carter put out too, to think about this in a broader scheme. Uh, do you want to reflect on some of these thoughts? Thank you, Sarah. Well, right. The last time I was here at Duke, it was to do some research about uh, Don Hollenbeck, a CBS correspondent who got caught up in the middle 
of the television confrontation between Edward R. Murrow and Joe McCarthy, and Hollenbeck uh, was red baited uh, by a Hearst columnist and killed himself. Um, so I, my mind is in a bit of history right now, and I uh, also remember that this is the birthday week, uh, no one else will remember this, I'm sure, of the first newspaper in the United States, public occurrences, both foreign and domestic. Um, and it was put out for only one issue before the government closed it down uh, by a guy who was not a journalist, who was a printer. I think he also ran a pub, and uh, which reminds me of a joke about journalists. How many journalists does it take to change a light bulb? Change? <laughs> um, <laughs> The people who are journalists then, and uh, I would say today, uh, this is the sort of an interesting, this is the first of four questions I have. So, so who is a journalist and how does that person define uh, his or her responsibilities to uh, the codes of ethics that, uh, uh, that Malcolm talked about, et cetera? Um, we have bloggers, we have humorists like John Stewart, we have bumptious sh uh, shoutfest hosts like Nancy Grace. Uh, Jim Squires, the former editor of the Chicago Tribune, writes, actors, comedians, politicians, lawyers, infamous criminals, and some who fit all five categories <laughs> regularly masquerade as reporters on newscasts and talk shows. So that's the first question. I think the second question is, uh, what level of skepticism do they have about um, what they observe and um, and the storylines that they are used to or uh, used to reporting or like reporting. Uh, there's a really interesting book by a guy by the name of Jack Lula who, uh, who suggests that the press gravitates towards uh, certain storylines that are unconsciously or uh, consciously echo uh, myth. And so journalists may, to be, may need to be especially cautious in approaching stories of conflict, race, gender, class, that appear at first blush to fit a stereotypical mythological formula of a story along the love of us. And uh, third, I, I have a question about, so what today is, should be the model of the journalist? And uh, here I, you know, I think Eric is asking a, a good question. I, I, uh, I, would hard to, I, would, I wouldn't want to give up on um, some of the notion of what a journalist should do. Um, it, you know, the, the, um, the person who is willing to initially report what goes on, whether it's by truth tellers and liars, what they say, and letting the readers, listeners, and viewers make up their own minds. I think a democracy does need journalists who try to report dispassionately and impartially. Um, they may not be successful. I was going to ask, but I won't because I know the response. So how many of you have been reported on? And uh, how many of you think those uh, reports were completely accurate and fair? I know what would happen in terms of the hands being raised. <laughs> None were. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I'm reminded of Murrow, who, uh, who said, uh, and even though his, re his report on McCarthy was almost not pure editorial, but it surely wasn't uh, dispassionate reporting, but he said, when the evidence on a controversial subject is fairly and calmly presented, the public recognizes it for what it is, an effort to illuminate rather than to agitate. So I, th I think that role is still worth keeping. And um, uh, you know, what, what, is the, uh, what are the taboos that exist in journalism? And this is something uh, I, I do worry about. Because you know, I've been thinking a lot about the reporting of suicide because I've been thinking about Don Holland but killing himself. And uh, it reminds me of a line in Benjamin Cheever's novel, The Plagiarist, where he says, people always lie about suicide. The family lies. The police lie. Even the medical examiner will lie if he has to. And I think there are some, so I, I would ask, you know, so uh, the society is willing to put up with what lies, and, and uh, the journalists are willing to put up with what lies, and uh, is that good for the society? Uh, in the case of Taboo about... Uh, 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 reporting suicide, it may be good that it, it discourages copycats by people who are disturbed and uh, will then kill themselves. But on the other hand, I think it really distorts how we support uh, 
a treatment of mentally ill people versus those who have physical ailments. And um, I once looked at 15 years of death certificates in my town to see how we reported suicides and, um, and how we didn't. And basically, the only people we talked about were young people. Uh, that's important. But there were, the, the, actually, the most people who killed themselves were, you know, sort of, uh, done, per, trying to shorten it here, uh, older single guys. Um, and uh, so there was nothing about our, in our paper about the pattern of suicides in our community. So I wrote about that. And uh, I still am disturbed about how, how we don't cover what we, when we uh, accept a taboo, it's a problem. And so there are other taboos maybe that we should think about, the, you know, whether when somebody is an accuser in a rape case, uh, uh, how, are we going to let that person be unnamed forever uh, uh, or, when, or when? And uh, finally, since others have talked about it and Hotting did, uh, and I was a member of the National News Council that the New York Times uh, editorialized against even before it began business, um, uh, why is it that the press is so sensitive about uh, media criticism, criticism itself? I think it's great that the, the Washington Post worries about what's going to be said by ombudsman. And I think I want to end on an optimistic note. I think one of the great things about change is from McCarthy's day when, uh, when Don Hollenbeck did a program called CBS Views the Press uh, on radio and talked about the New York press. And the New York press was very hostile toward him. The Salzberger of the New York Times said, oh, well, we shouldn't do this sort of stuff. It's, you know, we shouldn't talk about each other's performance. And he was red baited for this program. Um, I think the, 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 uh, the great thing is that we now have institutions within the press, public editors, ombudsmen, et cetera, who are looking critically at the New York Times and the Washington Post, et cetera. And then there are the bloggers and the people outside. So, uh, I'd like to end on an optimistic note. Um, Ari, I know that uh, you have thought about the problems that Hotting and others referred to um, when they uh, noted that prosecutors, government agencies put their version of the story out. Um, and one of the press's role is what? Checking, filtering, responding. I know that's part of at least what, what you might want to talk about today. Yeah, I think. Um, I, I, I've been thinking particularly about a case study, an experience I had almost exactly a year ago, where it was, I mean, if you remember the fall of 2006, the Mark Foley congressional page sex scandal was covering the, the news. It was a month or two before the congressional elections and Republicans were freaked out. They were going to lose seats, potentially lose both houses, which ended up happening. And, and I was home one evening and got a phone call from my editor who said, turn on the TV. So I turned on CNN, and there was this big exclusive banner across the bottom of the screen, and there was this amazing footage of these law enforcement officers staging an operation in Miami where they actually had a blowtorch, and they were you know, getting into this warehouse where there was allegedly a terrorist cell that had been operating. The, the whole country's going crazy. Um, we hear that there's this plot to blow up the Sears Tower. And I'm trying to call people at the Justice Department, figure out what's going on. Suddenly, forget about Mark Foley. It's all about this terrorist cell in Miami, you know, homegrown terror. And by the time morning rolls around and our 9.30 editorial meeting happens, we're in a frenzy. Um, the Justice Department, in its typically uh, non-committal way says there will be a press conference later that morning about a terrorism-related matter. Um, this is back when Alberto Gonzalez still had credibility and was still the Attorney General. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we're like at DEF CON 5 at NPR. We, everybody's seen this footage. We're, should we break into morning edition? Should we carry the press conference live? Should we, you know, update the show? Who's going to do which show? Because we know it's going to have to be on all the shows. Um, so I get to the press conference. It's packed with reporters. Um, the press people start handing out the packets with information that includes the indictments. And some of you may know where this story is heading. On page 10 or page 20 of this indictment, it describes these guys in Miami who basically decided they wanted to blow something up. And they took some pictures of the Sears Tower. And they never went to a terrorist training camp. And they never had any explosives training. And they never had any explosives. They went onto some website and said they were looking for somebody in Al Qaeda who could help them out. 
and <laughs> and of course an FBI agent offered to help them out. <laughs> and the guys asked for boots, and the FBI agent gave them boots. And and then in the midst of the Mark Foley scandal, there was this big bust. And halfway through the press conference we all realized that we had been duped. But by that point, it didn't matter because for 12 hours, the news cycle had been dominated by this plot to blow up the Sears Tower. We were all furious, but you know, a lot of good that did. And I, I actually talked to some career counterterrorism prosecutors months later, and they said they were all furious about this too because they really felt like this hurt their credibility. It's not that it wasn't a real case, it's that it was clearly presented, timed, uh, and, and brought forth in a way to manipulate the media. Um, it's certainly nothing new. It's certainly nothing that is limited to this administration. But I do think it's something that um, is easier to do in terrorism cases than in other cases. Not only because it's harder to criticize terrorism prosecutions. I think that's less true today than it was a few years ago. But also because the nature of terrorism prosecutions where you're uh, stopping something before it happens gives law enforcement much more flexibility. You know, they can monitor a cell for months or years even, and they can decide to stage a bust either when the cell seems about to go active or when it seems politically, strategically convenient to have a big terror bust. Um, so, I mean, the result of this is that we at NPR and other news organizations, I think, have this constant struggle between what somebody else on the panel last week referred to as being the lapdog and being the watchdog. And either way, you get criticized. I mean, if you're the lapdog, you're criticized for not being critical enough. If you're the watchdog, you're criticized for putting opinion, analysis, whatever you want to call it, into what should be just the facts reporting. Um, but it is a struggle that NPR constantly has about what we're being told the news is and what the news actually is. How blindly we follow what we're seeing on the major newspapers, the major news networks, how blindly we're following what the administration or other sources are telling us, how we're presenting to our listeners what we get in context. Because when people have been seeing for 12 hours on the TV that there's this major terrorism bust, and then we don't say anything about it, are we really doing our listeners the service we would be doing if we explained really what happened over the course of those 12 hours and how we were duped? Um, just sort of as a final thought, uh, some time ago, President Bush was explaining why he doesn't read the newspapers. And he said that it's because he doesn't like the filter. Uh, he prefers to get the news straight from his cabinet without the filter. And at the time, <laughs> that was sort of interpreted as being pejorative. And he may have meant it pejoratively, I don't know. But I think it's clear that the news media does need to be a filter. What the public needs is not an uncritical funnel of what's coming from the government or from wherever else, what the public needs is a filter of why you should care about what's happening, what's actually important as opposed to what you're told is important, and transparency in the process that we use to reach those conclusions so that if the public disagrees with that, they can understand why we've made the decisions that we made. Uh, Bill, what do you think about all this? <laughs> He's a commentator. He's going to comment. I spent a lot of years in this position. <clears throat> As a, as a columnist, uh, when there were major stories, you often came to the story after all the beat reporters had, had done their thing on it and uh, all the editorialists had weighed in. And uh, you still, the story was so big, you had to, you had to say something about it. And uh, I learned the technique which I will now employ. You go through all the stuff that's been said and find what the one thing that has not been said. And then you begin the column that says, everyone seems to have missed the real point. <laughs> uh, I now bring you the real point, which is not journalism's lies or its knowing uh, failures, it's, it's, it's unethical behavior, it's when we, do, when we do what we think is good journalism, but we do, we get ahead of ourselves in the journal. I, I want to read something I wrote back during uh, OJ1, which, which kind of makes this point. Add one more 
item to Otto von Bismarck's list of things no one should watch being made. <laughs> Not just sausages and laws, but also news. America spent the weekend of the O.J. Simpson saga watching news being made, and while it won't make anybody swear off, it might leave a lot of people more skeptical than ever about the ability of professional journalists to get things right. It shouldn't, which was Bismarck's point. News, like sausages and legislation, usually comes out pretty okay at the end. We finally get it fairly close to right. Saving grace for those in the business is that most of the time our audience doesn't see our goofs, our false starts, our confusions, our stupidity. We present nice, taut, professional-looking sausages of news with little hint of the mess those sausages lately were. Last weekend provided a peek inside the butcher shop a revelation of how awfully ordinary are the elegant and erudite men and women who bring us the news. I think of that scene at Nicole Simpson's condo. Some of you will remember this along with me. Where, as it turned out, hardly anything newsworthy was happening. But a few cops showed up, then a few reporters, and suddenly TV crews were tripping over each other, all of it instantly on our television screen, thanks to the CNN helicopter. That piece of action, though it turned out to be utterly meaningless at the end, didn't look bad. In fact, it must have seemed exciting, even a little glamorous, to be right on the scene where something big appeared to be in the offing. But then came the sausage making, the, the rumors, the groundless speculation, the almost almost sighting of Simpson's body. Did anybody who watched that doubt that he'd committed suicide and we'd stumble upon his body pretty quickly? Uh, somebody had seen OJ on the ground. Somebody had recognized the brown van as being very like that of the coroner. Still, someone else thought there was something hidden in the bushes near where the police were putting up their yellow tape. The point of all this is that Reporters on the scene usually trade their rumors and their speculation only with each other. The stuff that doesn't check out or that becomes irrelevant to the story doesn't end up on the air or in the newspaper most of the time. Writers calm down, editors edit, people whose job it is to exercise judgment exercise judgment. But this was live television. And we got it straight. And you got a sense then of what reporters are up against. Put yourself in the place of, of the reporter on that scene. This could be, could be the critical point of the story of your life. And you haven't got a clue as to what's really going on. All you know is that your job is to find out as much as you can, as quickly as you can, while avoiding that bane of live television, dead air. So you talk. You set the scene. You point out where the bodies of Nicole Simpson and Ronald Goldman were found. You recount the events leading up to the present action. You count police cars. Each little movement gets reported. And then what? It's almost impossible not to lapse into speculation particularly the speculation that you and your colleagues at the scene agree seems highly likely. For instance, that there might have been a suicide or some other gruesome discovery. This is what bothers me about so many of the cases that, that, that make us crazy, including our famous case here, here at Duke. You stay with a story for a few days, and it's impossible not to start thinking you know more than you could possibly know. Mm -hmm. You're smart enough not to put the unknowable in your story. You don't make it up. You've got a sense of ethics. But because you're pretty sure this is how it really happened, you would like to foreshadow 
the truth that you know. So that later on, when it turns out you're right, you can point back to your early stories and say, see, that was what I was sort of hinting at, you see. Uh, <laughs> you don't dare write it straight. And the speculation, not mean speculation, the speculation from people who thought they knew what the story likely was and wanted to foreshadow that they knew what it was, is what drove a lot of the coverage. You start off thinking of, of, of the uh, Duke Lacrosse case, for instance. If you're convinced that this is a crazy woman who's bringing crazy charges, you focus on everything you can find out about her. If you think this is a story of race and privilege, you play that end of it up. You're not doing nasty things. You're not being vicious. You're trying to set the table so you have a place to put new developments as they arise. Uh, worse, you can't play it just straight. You can't say, either on a, in a newspaper or on a television uh, program, we don't have any more information about this thing than we had uh, yesterday. Uh, <laughs> we'll get back to you when we learn something. <laughs> no, you have to report. You have to advance the story. And that's where you get photographs of the houses where the boys live. That's where you get the speculation about the brown fan. And that's where you also get the other game we play, which is leapfrog. You can't just catch up to what the competition had. You have to report what the competition had and go beyond that. So you play this insane game of leapfrog because you have to. Uh, how do you avoid this? I am not that sure you can. You can hire better people, smarter people, and give them better editors. Uh, good editors can help an awful lot. Uh, but on the free-for-all that is the internet these days, uh, you don't have editors, but the stories when they take on a life of their own on the net can force the hands even of good editors. We'll work it out, I guess, but it's likely to get pretty messy in the meantime. If you don't have a strong stomach, uh, you better stay out of the shop where journalism news uh, makes its sausages. <laughs> it's, it's likely to get pretty, pretty messy in there. Uh, I find myself very much like Harding, though, uh, not all that sanguine about our ability to put it right, at least in the near term. So I'm wondering, as, as each of you has heard uh, your fellow panelists and as you've been thinking about this, this question of how good or bad are things? And how much are things changing and why are they changing? So a couple of ideas about why they're changing. Um, this idea of the 24-hour news cycle, the uh, cable TV, uh, cable news networks, the, the um, internet, um, the ownership structure of news organizations changing, um, but also ombudsman, I think it's getting better or worse. And, and if there's a problem, what would you identify as, as the locus of the problem or problems, particularly anything that could be, that could be made better? Right? So any, all. I think as far as, as things getting better, one good thing we can point to is the um, prevalence of, um, of ombudsmen and the number of papers that are now willing to, uh, you know, having someone, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a, it's a person who um, is responsible for being sort of the reader's representative on the paper, and the News Observer has one, and um, a lot of other papers do. And of course that stems from what was a really, uh, you know, difficult time for journalism, the Jason Blair case, when we, uh, all of us, I think, anybody in the profession felt a great deal of uh, loss of credibility from that. But I think just the fact that, that more people or more newspapers are, are having that kind of structure in, in place is a good thing. So somebody whose job is, is to think about whether they, yes, they, it's how not, good a job is being done. And, and they're writing about it every week and they're very critical and the New York Times 
uh, Clark Hoyt writes a you know wonderful column about you know that he will skewer sometimes what the news the Times does, and you know it gives you the other side in a sense. You know, one worry I have that nobody's mentioned yet is the changing news consumer, which is to say that I think there will always be news organizations that are doing well and that will continue to do well and strive for excellence. And more and more, I think there are places one can go for news that don't do it well. And what I worry is that there's no longer a sense that one needs to get news from a place that does it well, but instead you can get exactly what you want with the angle you want, with the slant you want, with the spin and style you want. Um, and it sort of drags down the, 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 the whole enterprise. Um, if consumers aren't coming to the news organizations that do it well, if there isn't even a sense that these are the news organizations that do it well as opposed to sort of, you know, buffet a la carte style, um, getting the kind of news you want, I fear that it, it sort of degrades the whole thing. So in that sense, the, the competition of these other entities, rather than making things better, potentially makes it worse, the, the sort of least common denominator or... I, I, I fear that on some level that may be happening. I mean, I don't know if other people agree. If, if it were as simple as some outlets, news outlets doing it well and others doing it poorly, uh, I think we, we quickly weed out the bad ones. Uh, most news organizations, uh, professional ones, mainstream ones, do their work pretty well most of the time. And uh, even, even in the big highly publicized cases? Well, that's what I was about to say. It, <laughs> it depends on the nature of the case. You, 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 you can't avoid, I don't know how you can avoid the assumption that once you start on a story, you know more than you do. Harding met this, this morning mentioned Whitewater. You ought to go back and look at some of those early stories for this confession from some reporter. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what Whitewater is. I don't know what crimes and, and misdemeanors are being alleged in this case. The fact is none of them did know, but we all wrote about it as though we, did, we knew more than we knew because we thought everybody else knew more than we knew. Uh, and, and, and we, we commenced to play the leapfrog game, uh, missing completely that there was no premise for the game in the first place. Uh, I can't imagine any rule or set of rules or press councils or ombudsman that will change that. So I don't, exp I don't think it's getting better. I don't think it's getting worse. Uh, I think what, if what you're looking for is a solution to these problems, looking to journalists is the wrong place. We can't fix it. You know, it, it does, uh, you, the use of the Whitewater example and thinking about the Duke Lacrosse case and some of the issues that you've raised about the fact that journalists have to respond to certain things. One of those issues is that they respond to prosecutorial and investigative actions, which are public actions and then do get reported. So how much of this would you turn back to the panel on the prosecutors and say, we were going to report on Whitewater as long as that grand jury was going on, right? And as long as there was, what, um, where there's smoke, there's a fire, where there's an investigation, there must be something, where there's an indictment, there must be something, where there's a, um, highly publicized blowtorch Low opening <laughs> in the warehouse. You know, there's kind of an implication that there's a there, there. Um, is it your sense that, that actually, if there's any finger pointing to be done, you'd want to point it back at the government? Is there, is there a sense that, um, that if the game has to be changed, it has to be changed by the lawyers, by the courts, by the government? You know, is there any, any consensus up here that that's where the problem comes from? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think the system is set up to be a contest between the press and the government. And, uh, you know, who's winning? <laughs> I, I think sometimes we win, sometimes they win. Um, uh, I think it's, it's, um, it's up to the media to have discipline in situations where, you know, what the what, question why the government is having the press conference now, question why you're getting this leak now. Um, question the source's motives, look, read the indictment, um, make your own independent judgment. Uh, 
you know, they have their jobs to do, but your job is to be independent and evaluate the facts. And when you're writing a story about somebody who's under investigation or who's just been indicted, you know, you have an obligation to signal to the readers high up in the story that these are unproven allegations. Um, this is just an indictment. The defense has yet to respond. The lawyers often don't comment. You can't do more than that. Well, but, I wondered about that because uh, some prosecutor's offices have a no comment policy or an almost no comment policy. And obviously in the Nifon case, one of the, one of the charges was that the, the uh, impropriety of making various comments at various points in time um, publicly. Would it be better if prosecutor's offices didn't comment or then would that be in, in Bill's yeah. uh, scenario, there'd just be speculation right at that point? What, what is your sense about how that should work, Lauren? Well, uh, I, I want to make uh, several points here. One is uh, I, I think the, le the people in the legal system in general need to be helpful to reporters because uh, often journalists don't know as much as you want them to know. Um, and, um, you, you know, given what's going on in journalism, I think uh, some people may not choose to go into journalism that we wish would go into journalism, so it may be even more of an issue. Uh, several other things I want to mention. Uh, come to mind, resources, uh, others have mentioned this, but you know, when we sold our paper, the first thing the new owners did was to dramatically reduce the size of the news staff. And we were already worrying about covering the courts in our community, the local court, the Metropolitan Daily that had a zoned edition had stopped covering the court. So we were, we were the only news organization covering the court. It took an inordinate amount of time to get just to find out what was going on in regular cases. So I think resources. Uh, third, um, I worry about the consumer, uh, the change in what the consumer expects or wants. Um, so now we train our jour journalism students at Medill not only to be good writers and print reporters, but to be multimedia. We spend a lot of time, so how do you operate the audio equipment, the, how do you operate the camera? And I was talking to a professor who's, who is a journalist and who was saying, just commenting, he wasn't criticizing what he was saying. So when he goes out as a journalist now, it may be that the focus will be on the, the video clip and the comment of somebody who's not an expert but offers something pretty titillating. In, 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 and so I wonder what that means. Um, and then finally, you know, when psychologists inform us about how, what we should know about the human brain uh, as journalists, um, one thing that comes back is sort of emotion. There, if there's some sort of emotional response, the person is more likely to remember the news, the news story. So I, I wonder whether the consumer leads us to do some kind of reporting that isn't necessarily that thorough, but is, uh, does respond to what psychologists tell us. And, and I'm not sure it's better for the society of this kind of reporting either. So 20 years ago at the World Series, St. Louis Cardinals had this pitcher named John Tudor, who I don't know if you might remember him. He was a really good guy who was having a really bad day. And he launched, after a game, he launched into this tirade about journalists, which had one really important thing to it, that he reintroduced the word schmo to the American vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> and it immediately created all this panic in the press box. Like, Does it have any? Does it not have any? I mean, it's not in my dictionary. But the point, <laughs> the point he made was, you know, what do you guys have to have to do this? I mean, what do you need? A driver's license? I mean, what do you... <laughs> The, the underlying problem that is complicated by the acceleration of everything going so fast is that in, in too many places, being wrong has become somehow related to this bizarre risk-reward ratio that I mean, everybody wants to hit the Dave Kingman home run that goes out onto Waveland Avenue and everybody oohs and ahs and they don't look at the fact that he's hitting a buck fifty. I mean, nobody's paying attention to the fact that being wrong is bad. And, and it's filtering down to the student journalist, journalist level because that's the culture that they're being brought up in. You've, you've got, and I'm, and I'm not painting with a broad brush and saying all traditional institutions are pure and all digital ones are not. But we have to get back to the idea that there's got to be some accountability when you make these decisions. I just want you, you asked us to, and I didn't, uh, you asked us to grade the, the media. 
And An academic question. <laughs> And it's, it's, uh, it's always hard to answer that kind of thing, particularly when, frankly, uh, we aren't here to look at the news reports day after day after day. So I'm reluctant to do that. You know, obviously, there were A's, a few A's perhaps, and there were F's, and probably there were the vast majority that somewhere in the middle, and, and I, I, you know, that's the safe thing to say. But, but I think that the question has to be asked slightly differently, and that is, just responding to what was said, Okay, so how, how accurate was and fair, et cetera, was the initial reporting? But then when a news organization screws up, what, what does it do then? And I, I think that's important. You know, there was a, the, the, the Raleigh paper apparently had a, a, a writer who, after uh, her inaccuracies in the columns, uh, apologized. And I think that's, that, that's what we... We need to look at how new news organizations behave, what they do differently as a result of screwing up. And uh, I, I, I've been a critic of the New York Times uh, from my experience on the News Council and other things. But you know, when Jason Blair happened, uh, they certainly did some things, started doing some things differently. And, and so you know, I give them credit for that, for example. I had a fabulous editor uh, named Bill Marimo, who was at NPR a few years ago, who uh, told me something that he did when he was a novice reporter. He's since won Pulitzer Prizes, but um, back when he started reporting, and he said he did it all the way through his reporting career, uh, when he finished a story, he would call everybody who was in the story and ask for their feedback, positive or negative. And he suggested that all of his reporters do the same thing. And when I started doing it, people were so dumbfounded <laughs> at this idea that a reporter would care whether they got it right or not. Um, you know, I think that's, that's kind of sad. It certainly wouldn't have occurred to me to do it had he not suggested it. But after he suggested it, it seemed like a really sort of basic, basic thing to do. Um, well, at a, at a small town paper, we used to send out, a le I sent out a, a letter uh, with eight questions on it. It was sort of what we call the accuracy check letter. And, it was to, to sources, and generally speaking, the sources um, thought the story uh, was accurate, and we scored brownie points for sending out the letter. Uh, but what I did learn was that most of the errors were not tied to the reporter's work, but were tied to the people who wrote the headlines or put the cut lines under the photographs. So we learned something about our behavior and tried to compensate for that, those errors. Bill, do you want to have the last word? Okay. <laughs> I think it's important to remember that we're not talking about the traditional journalism, traditional press. Most of the time, the work is pretty good. Most of the time, the systems we use, the sources we rely on, help us get it straight. The cops on the beat, when we get to know them, give us tips that help. Uh, the prosecutors give us information that's helpful. Uh, everybody we work with tend, it, it, it tends as a rule to help us put out a good product. And I'm nervous about our trying to make rules and, and, and guidelines based on hugely exceptional cases. Uh, it, it trying to, trying to, it's like trying to, to run your personnel office, your human uh, resources department, by reference to Jason Blair and, and Steve Glass and, and the people who screwed up. Uh, there are not many people who go around making stuff up. Uh, and, but there are a few. And I don't think there's any real way to prevent it. You'd like to keep the old guys around for as long as you can because they've seen the stuff a couple of times come around in the past. And and the smell test may be as effective a, a, a device as you've got in this. I don't think you can make rules to do it. Well, thank our panelists very much for um, their thoughts this morning.